This program is brought to you by RTS on iTunes U from the Distance Education Department of Reformed Theological Seminary. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920. Now I'd like to begin uh, talking about uh, phenomenology. Let me see on page... 88, uh, let me get this up on the board. School of thought called phenomenology, and there are a number of thinkers uh, in the school of thought, but uh, I'm going to focus on the, the most famous one, whose name is Edmund Husserl. And phenomenology, to be perfectly honest, uh, I mean, of all the philosophical schools and all the philosophical methods that uh, we're talking about in this course, I think probably phenomenology is the one that I, I understand the least. I can tell you what the phenomenologists say, but I'm not sure that I understand their logic, that I understand their passion, that I understand why, what they think they're gaining from it. Uh, some people are very enthusiastic about phenomenology, uh, uh, but I, I guess I've never quite seen the point. I think when you're teaching philosophy to people, it's important that you help them to see not only what the philosopher said, but also kind of what impels him to say it, what, what he thinks he accomplishes by this. I've tried to do that with most of the other philosophers and theologians that we've talked about in this course, and I expect to do it through the remainder of the course, I, 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 I am most frustrated by phenomenology in this regard. I'm not really sure uh, what they're up to, but I'll tell you what the phenomenologists say that they're doing, and, the, uh, and from time to time I'll, I'll expound a little bit. The phenomenologists uh, attempt to uh, provide fundamental descriptions free from distortion by theoretical presuppositions and prejudices of things themselves or of phenomena. That's a quote from a book uh, uh, by uh, Cooper uh, that uh, deals with this. Um, and in empiricism, remember empiricists say that uh, knowledge comes through sense experience. Uh, em empiricists uh, go about trying to uh, ha have this kind of view. They, they have the thought that uh, uh, there's reality out there, and here's my mind here, and uh, there's a kind of uh, mediator between the mind and reality. The mediator is the sense datum, what my eyes see and perhaps record in the brain. There's the sense image, there's the sense datum. And many empiricists have thought that I don't really perceive the world out there. All I perceive are my sense data. And that uh, from my sense data, I deduce the world out there. I think there must be a world out there if I'm having these sense data. So the sense datum as a mediator between the mind and reality. Now, that, that's caused a lot of problems, of course. Uh, the, this picture of the sense datum as a mediator, uh, Barclay, you remember, uh, uh, took on this analysis and he said, well, yeah, we have these sense data, but I don't know if there's anything outside the sense data. I don't know if there's anything that the sense data point to. Uh, all, I, uh, all I know are my sense data. I don't know anything about the world beyond my sense data. So therefore, all I know are my own perceptions. All I know is this picture of the world that we have, and the picture might be accurate or it might not be. So empiricists have used this idea that, that our thoughts our concepts, our ideas, our pictures of reality. 
and they, they, they reveal the world out there, but in a way, they, they're a barrier. Uh, they keep us from knowing the world out there. I had a friend who, who wrote to me about phenomenology, and he says the, the main difference between phenomenology and empiricism is this, that the, for the phenomenologist, the sense data, the perceptions, the, the mental experiences I have, those are not a picture of reality. Those are, the re those are a window to reality. Uh, these are the way I see reality. Uh, they are not a barrier. When I look at my ideas, and my thoughts, and my mental experiences, that is reality. I'm really seeing it there. Now, a little bit of terminology. A phenomenon is anything with which the subject is confronted, including my own thoughts, okay? Without any suggestion that the phenomenon is, as Kant supposed, a mere appearance of a basic reality. Now, Kant uh, said that the, the phenomena are the world as it appears to us but not necessarily the real world. The phenomenologist reverses Kant. The phenomenologist denies what Kant says. Kant says that phenomena, the world as it appears to us, is just the appearance of something more basic, the noumenal. The phenomenologist says, no, there's nothing more basic than phenomena. To know the world is to know the phenomenon. For Husserl, the phenomenon is what is given to consciousness. Uh, it includes the mental act itself uh, that I'm thinking or that I'm doubting or that I'm imagining. And uh, of course, I can't doubt that I'm doubting. I can't doubt that I'm thinking. Descartes was right about that. I can't doubt that this mental act is taking place. But when I have a mental act, there's always something more going on because every mental concept is a concept of something, all right? When I have a mental uh, concept of the tree out there, it's not just a concept, it's a concept of the tree. The tree is, in a way, a part of the concept so that when I'm experiencing the concept, when I'm experiencing the sense data, when I'm experiencing the work of my mind, I'm experiencing the reality at the same time. So notice that opposite to Kant, Husserl identifies the phenomenon with the thing in itself. See, for Kant, the phenomenon was completely uh, distinct from the thing in itself. For Husserl, the phenomenon, the world as it appears to me, is the thing in itself. There's, there's nothing else beyond the phenomenon. To know the phenomenon is to know the thing in itself. It is this with which we're most directly confronted, and therefore it is this that's directly, that, that is unquestionably real. Phenomena are not mere psychological ideas, but rather, and here's where I start to, where they start to lose me, the phenomena are rather the ideal meanings and universal relations with which the ego is confronted in its experience. So I guess what that means is that the phenomena is the reality, not just a psychological impression. I mean, some, sometimes my psychological impressions are just illusions. Sometimes they're dreams. Sometimes they're, they should be distinguished from reality. But the phenomenon, as, as Husserl speaks of it, is real. It's the real world. It's what I'm trying to know. Now, what method do we pursue in trying to know the real world? Well, Husserl says, to understand the phenomena and focus on them in their purity, it is necessary to bracket or abstain from suppositions about the relations of the phenomena to a world outside them. Okay, this is, this is Kant. Kant says you've got this phenomena, and you've got the real world. You've got the noumenal out here. And then you, you can 
you really can't know what the relationship is between the phenomena and the real world. You just have to sort of suppose. And so he says, well, who knows? There might be a God out there. There might be a freedom. There might be immortality. There might be all these things. So you just don't know, uh, really. Uh, you just have to have to suppose. Husserl says, don't suppose. Okay, Husserl says, don't get caught up in wondering how the phenomenon is related to something beyond it. Just put that out of your mind. Uh, we all would like to speculate. We all would like to know. But just, just ignore that. Uh, and that's what he calls the, uh, uh, he, he calls it the uh, bracketing. Uh, he calls it abstaining. He calls it the epoche. He calls it the cessation from suppositions about the relations of the phenomena to a world outside them. So phenomenology resists any discussions of whether phenomena represent or reflect a reality outside themselves. Uh, Husserl calls that the transcendent. So uh, we have to get beyond the natural attitude, what Husserl calls the natural attitude, toward the contents of the mind, which leads to contradictions and other problems, to the philosophical attitude. The philosophical attitude, uh, um, well, the, the natural attitude includes that of the natural sciences, where we, we see this experiment and we say, okay, what, what is that, uh, you know, what's behind that? What, what's making that happen, you know? This is the phenomenon. Okay, let's get behind that and find out the cause. That's not what the phenomenologist wants to do. Uh, phenomenologist, uh, phenomenology, therefore, is not scientific. It's not part of the scientific method. Uh, it's philosophy rather than science. In the philosophical attitude, we discern the essences of the phenomena, and that's what le yields uh, objective knowledge. So I don't know, I picture it as just you know, kind of closing your eyes and saying, well, what, what, what am I thinking about? And then think about it real, real hard. <laughs> and just describe it. Don't, don't, don't ask, well, where does that thought come from? Just, just try to describe your thought. If you're thinking about a cow, you know, just describe the cow. That's, that's a phenomenology. You're doing a phenomenology of the cow when you do that. I don't know, to, I mean, to put it that way seems to reduce it to triviality. <laughs> but not, I mean, when you get to more sophisticated concepts and you ask, well, what is, what is, uh, I, I have a friend who's a famous sociologist and he died a few years ago and he used what he called a phenomenological method and he wrote a book on humor. And so he says, well, what is humor? Let's do a phenomenology. Let's just think, what, what, what's going on when we laugh at something, you know? What's that like? Um, I read the book. I, I always thought he was being kind of arbitrary. <laughs> what, what makes, he was Jewish and I'm not, so what makes him laugh may be different from what makes me laugh. I don't know. But uh, anyway, that seems to be what it is. It's kind of really armchair philosophy. I mean, you sort of, uh, I, I accuse Thales of being an armchair philosopher. You just kind of sit down and say, well, what, what is the world like after all? What, meaning, what does it look like to me? Uh, you know, what, uh, okay, I had breakfast this morning. What was that experience like? Well, I described my memories in minute detail. Uh, well, if that occurs to you, if that, uh, appeals to you, uh, you can be a phenomenologist. Uh, anyway, uh, there are themes there that we may refer back to. Martin Heidegger now on page 89, who is both a phenomenologist, but he's the beginning of a new movement, which is sometimes called existentialism. Uh, phenomenology and existentialism kind of run together uh, in the history of philosophy. Uh, Heidegger, uh, often called a phenomenologist, he studied with Husserl, and uh, he was the successor to Husserl as a professor of philosophy at the University of Freiburg in 1928. 
uh, also called an existentialist, uh, as others have been, like uh, Carl Jaspers and Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus and others. Heidegger is a great influence on Rudolf Bultmann, the theologian. We'll see how that works later on. Uh, but uh, Bultmann and Heidegger were colleagues for some years at the University of Marburg. Uh, one kind of blot on Heidegger's record, uh, he joined the Nazi party in 1933 when he became rector of Freiburg University. He stepped down as rector the following year, but may have collaborated the, with the Nazis until the end of the war. And there are a lot of people who just don't like Heidegger because he was a Nazi collaborator. Um, I don't know, you know to what extent he was. There are some who I, I think are very strongly prejudiced against Heidegger uh, uh, because, because of that. Uh, uh, I had one philosopher professor at Princeton who's uh, part Jewish. He lost some relatives in the Holocaust, and, uh, and he uh, had nothing good to say about Heidegger. He, he didn't like his thought. He didn't like his arguments. He didn't like anything about Heidegger. Uh, thought that Heidegger was just a kind of windbag. Uh, well, maybe he was, but I, I thought there was a certain amount of prejudice there uh, uh, against his thought because of Heidegger's actions. And, I realize you can't separate those entirely, but uh, there is that, uh, um, you have to be careful about that. Heidegger, uh, his work is divided, as some other philosophers are divided. Uh, Wittgenstein uh, is divided between the early Wittgenstein and the later Wittgenstein. Heidegger is divided between the early Heidegger and the later Heidegger. The early Heidegger uh, is represented by his book, uh, Sein und Zeit, Being and Time. And uh, in this book, uh, Heidegger is trying to get away from the subject-object distinction as the fundamental distinction. Remember, uh, uh, I think I pointed out to you that in epistemology, we usually think that the uh, there is an object of knowledge and there's a subject of knowledge. The subject of knowledge is the knower. The object of the knowledge is what we know. And sometimes it's difficult to see how these are related to one another. Well, Heidegger thinks there's something wrong about this, something wrong about this picture of the self as a mind trying to represent objects in a world outside itself, a kind of se separation between the mind and the reality. And he's trying to get away from that. Another thing he's trying to get away from is the idea that our everyday beliefs require some kind of a philosophical foundation if we're really going to believe them. And again, that's a Descartes' supposition, uh, which uh, Heidegger disagrees about. Now, uh, phenomenologists have often made use of a distinction between pre-theoretical pre thought and theoretical thought. Um, Hermann Duiveard, who was a Christian philosopher, and some of you may uh, be familiar with his work, uh, Hermann Duiveard was very much influenced by phenomenology and somewhat by Heidegger, I think. And so Duiveard uh, makes as one of his fundamental distinctions a distinction between uh, what he calls naive experience and theoretical thought, or sometimes he says pre-theoretical thought and theoretical thought. Uh, the, the, the difference is between the way we normally go about thinking. You know, you go out in the garden and you look around and you see the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and all those things. And uh, you see it as a kind of buzzing, blooming confusion. Everything is there together. And, and you remark on its beauty, and you remark on some things like its pleasantness and so on. And you get a general impression from the mind. But that's, uh, that's not scientific observation. That's not theoretical observation. To do theoretical observation, you zoom in on one thing, maybe marigolds, okay? You're going to become an expert on marigolds, and so you uh, focus in on just the, the living things in the garden, and the marigolds, and the 
relationships with other living things, and you do experiments that focus on those. Now, that's all well and good, and Dewey Veer agrees that that's okay, and Heidegger says that's okay. I mean, there's a place for science, and it's good to do science, but you have to remember that you lose something when you do science. You're, you're, when you do science, you're, you're taking things out of their, their natural context to some extent. Uh, you're, you're taking the marigold out of this buzzing, blooming uh, uh, unity of the garden just to look at the marigold more carefully. So uh, that's okay, but just remember that it's, uh, you're, you're tearing it out of its environment, and you lose something that way. When you tear things out of their environment to look at them as individuals, you, you lose something there. Now, Heidegger is interested in understanding being. Uh, here's the philosopher who wants to understand being in general. Uh, that's traditional metaphysics, understanding being as being, remember? Uh, being qua being. Uh, but uh, Heidegger is chastened by Immanuel Kant. Kant said you can't said that metaphysics is, is wrong, uh, metaphysics will never get you anywhere. So uh, uh, Heidegger uh, agrees that there's something wrong with the old metaphysics, trying to find out the nature of being, trying to understand the universe through logic and, and so on. And, uh, and Heidegger says, we, we can't really do that, but we can do something that may be a, a road into metaphysics. And that thing is to try to understand human being, okay? We can't know being in general, but we can know ourselves. And uh, so this is the phenomenologist to see. We, we can know our own experience. We can know what happens to us and what we see and what we hear. We can know ourselves. Uh, human existence is what Heidegger calls not being, but being there. He uses the German word Dasein. And that, that's to say that every human being is in an environment. Every human being is in a context. Um, we are not ripped out of our context, as in theory. We are immersed in our context. We are here, we are being in the world. And so uh, we, we can examine our own nature as being in the world. Objects are not brute things that are somehow put to use. The use of an object is part of its very nature. When we use a hammer, uh, a hammer is, is not just a material thing. A hammer has a purpose. A, a hammer has a, has a uh, a, a teleology to it. The hammer is in order to pound nails. And that, that's what, you know, remember Husserl was saying, every idea that we have is an idea of something. Uh, our ideas all kind of have hooks that, that, that go into the real world. They're inseparable from reality. And so uh, every concept is a concept of something. Every human tool is a tool to do something. And so when we understand ourselves, we inevitably understand our context. We understand the world. The world is not something separate from us. The world is something that's, in, uh, that's uh, joined to us very closely. Uh, further, the world is constituted by language. I'm going to tell you later, 20th century philosophy is the uh, century of language. In the 20th century, everybody is trying to study language and trying to assess the philosophical importance of language. Well, Heidegger says, you know, you have these concepts in your mind, you formulate them in language. So, uh, and just as the concept is linked to the real world, our language is linked to the real world, and the world is is constituted by language. Uh, the world is uh, made up by language. It's kind of like Kant's idea of, 
of the world being structured by human concepts. Uh, so we have a communal pre-understanding of being, and this is the way we get back into being, uh, by understanding ourselves, understanding our concepts, understanding our language, understanding how all those things are united uh, to the real world. So there's no such thing as brute facts. We sometimes use the phrase brute facts to indicate facts that are not interpreted by anybody, facts that are, are totally apart from our concepts and ideas. No, there aren't any brute facts like that. And by the way, Cornelius Van Til denies the existence of brute facts because uh, you know, all facts are interpreted by God. Uh, Heidegger's not thinking about that, but he thinks that all facts are part of our experience. All facts are interpreted by man. And there, uh, you know, you might ask uh, whether uh, Heidegger, like Kant, is uh, uh, exchanging the role of God for the role of man. At any rate, when you're just ex examining your own experience, you don't need philosophy until, you know, questions come up. Questions like, uh, you know, do I really see what I think I see? Uh, here I am, and there's sometimes in life there seems to be a, 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 a curtain that comes down, you know, where, where your experience seems to be more like a barrier than a, uh, the, than a method of uh, reaching out to, to the world. And you start asking questions like, who am I? How am I different from the tree? How am I different from the rest of being? So that we come to see ourselves as mere spectators, and we come to see things as brute objects. Uh, well, their uh, uh, philosophers need to think a little bit about the nature of human being, docile, uh, particularly human existence, and here we come to the background of the term existentialism, studying human existence, uh, human existence, top of 90, characterized by finitude limits, uh, particularly temporal. This, this is when I start feeling myself estranged uh, from my phenomena, uh, when I think of myself as limited, when I think of myself as as, as finite, when I think of myself as, as temporal. And of course the extreme of this is the limit of death. Human beings are headed toward nothingness. Remember Nietzsche now. Uh, human beings are headed toward nothingness. Human life is being toward death. Jean-Paul Sartre will later see uh, believes that human life is, uh, in distinction from all other being, human life incorporates non-being in it. So all of us think, I'm going to die. You know, I mean, dogs don't usually think that way, as far as I know. Uh, lions and tigers and cockroaches and other kinds of life uh, don't uh, think, well, I'm going to die sometime. I've got to make preparations. Uh, you know, it's only human beings who think that way. You know, I'm going to die sometime. What do I want to do before I die? How much time do I have left? Um, so that, that being toward death characterizes human life. That, that means we're always in a kind of anxiety. And whatever we do, we risk death. Uh, we know that we could die any time. Any accident would, would occur, but we risk uh, and we, we're aware of risking, and in risk we make choices, and, and we achieve transcendence over this risky life. And uh, you know, think about Kierkegaard here. I mean, think of Kierkegaard saying, "What, we, what you've got to do is choose. Your, your, your humanity is in your not in your uh, definition, not in some abstract description, but your humanity is in your choosing and your." Uh, reaching out to, to make a decision. So in, in, in risk, uh, we achieve transcendence, transcendence of the world, not uh, subject over object, but direct participation in the, in the movements of the world, transcendence in our relations with others, which, are, which he calls rapport, 
transcendence over time. Uh, we can get beyond the present. We don't just live in the present. We're anticipating death. We're risking uh, the future. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre does it a little bit, bit differently. Jean-Paul Sartre says, uh, we have no nature. We have no definition. Uh, Aristotle said that we're rational animals by, by nature. And then we live out that nature, uh, trying to live as rationally as we can. Christianity says that our nature is that we're the image of God, and we ought to, to reach out and uh, do uh, and, and behave as the image of God. Sartre says we've we got to try to be atheists. Sartre uh, develops uh, existentialism in a very atheistic direction. Sartre says we have no nature because there's been no God to design, to design us. So uh, uh, man man is the being that uh, you know most 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 creatures start with essence and then they live out that essence in their existence their existence are their choices and their decisions so if you're a dog well your your essence is to be a dog you have canine properties and then you you go and live out that by by uh, doing things that dogs do. But with human beings, there's nothing that human beings do. There is no definition. There is no essence. So we just start off with our existence. We start off with our choices. And uh, those choices are what defines us. Those choices are what eventually produces an essence. Uh, Perhaps after somebody has died, you can say that man was a great philosopher or that man was a great evangelist or that woman was a great homemaker. But you don't know that until the person is dead. We don't start off as philosophers or scientists or homemakers. We start off just making decisions out of nowhere. And it's uh, in the end that we have our essence. So Sartre says you know, existentialism is the view that ex existence precedes essence. All right? Uh, if you're an Aristotelian, you might believe that uh, man has an essence, rational animal, and, and that we should live out our lives making decisions in accordance with that essence. Sartre says no. If you're an existentialist, we start off with existence, our, our decisions, and we uh, uh, gain our essence that way. Well, um, that's, that's the early Heidegger and uh, Sartre, who, who is kind of similar uh, to Heidegger in that respect. Then there's the later Heidegger. Uh, very difficult to describe the, the work of the later Heidegger, but he is an influence on some theologians, so we ought to uh, have at least a general idea. In his later writing, Heidegger says that Dasein, that is human life here and now, human life in the world, Dasein and the world are manifestations of something greater, namely being itself. Now remember, this is always Heidegger's goal. Uh, as a philosopher to understand being itself. But uh, he kind of gave up on that because of the Kant, Kant's critique of metaphysics, and he uh, wanted to be more modest and to start with uh, human being. But now in his later writings, he's convinced that, that human being, Dasein, is a clue to something beyond man. So... Uh, uh, it tells us a little something about being itself. Well, what do we know about being itself? Being itself, first of all, is not something that we should try to master. It is beyond us. It's incomprehensible. Uh, don't try to master the world. Let it master you. Let it be. You remember the Beatles song? <laughs> uh, kind of a slogan of existentialism, actually. Let it, let it be. Um, this, this becomes a model later on of uh, revelation in theology. Uh, Abling Fuchs, Robinson, uh, 
who, who say that everything is interpretation and we don't interpret the world, the world, I'm sorry, we don't interpret the word, but the word interprets us. Uh, well, 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 we'll have some more to say about that uh, later on. Um, on page... Uh, 91, uh, there's a longer discussion of Jean-Paul Sartre, which I indicated to you earlier, and I think I'm going to pass over this. This is material taken from my ethics class, my ethics outline dealing with Sartre. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you, you might think that uh, because Sartre doesn't believe that we have any essence, because, there, I mean, the reason why we have no essence is because there's no God. Uh, if we have an essence, it's because God has designed us and made us that way. Uh, but we don't, so we just start with existence and uh, make our decisions. And maybe at the end, uh, we'll, somebody will describe us uh, as having a certain essence. But uh, uh, Sartre is trying, of course, to be as consistently atheistic as he can possibly be. And you might think that uh, somebody like that would be an ethical relativist, that he would have nothing to do with the concept of responsibility. Uh, I mean, who are we responsible to? Who, who are we answer, answerable to? But so, Sartre kind of surprises you here. He, he says that uh, uh, we do have responsibility for what we do. We are, uh, um, because we're totally ethically free, uh, freedom goes along with having no essence. You can become anything you want to. You're not limited. Uh, so you can choose anything you want to. But if you can choose anything you want to, then, of course, uh, you, you have no excuses. Uh, I mean, let's let's say you're you're uh, picked up for for shoplifting. Well, you tell the judge, I'm I'm sorry, you know, I I was raised in a poor family. I, I was never taught right from wrong. I, I had this problem and that problem, and I'm poor and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, you might be able to get some sympathy from the judge for that. Uh, but do you lose your responsibility? Uh, Sartre would say, no, you don't lose your responsibility because uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, you have made your choices. You're not forced to make choices. And uh, your heredity, your environment does not make you a shoplifter. Uh, uh, nothing forces you to be a shoplifter. You say, well, uh, you're, you're poor. Uh, but being poor, that, that's a limit in a way. But uh, in, in one sense, you even choose your limits. Uh, being poor is not a limit unless you feel that it's a limit. I mean, you, lots of people are poor, uh, but they don't rob, rob stores. Um, lots of people are poor, but they're happy, uh, you know, as, as Walt Disney has been telling us for years. Uh, so. Uh, you really have no excuses for the things that you do. You have to take all of that on yourself. It's dreadful responsibility. So Sartre really uh, uh, has a lot to say about ethics, and uh, uh, it's kind of surprising. We wonder, uh, of course, we wonder where all this comes from. I mean, why should we take responsibility? Are we obligated to do it? And if we're obligated to do it, what obligates us? You know, if we, we have no essence that obligates us to do it. We have no God uh, in, uh, in Sartre's the <coughs> philosophy. <coughs> There's no God who tells us what to do. So where does this responsibility come from? Um, Sartre even says that, there's, uh, that we have an obligation to, uh, to uh, ex express our freedom to express our lack of an essence, to express our freedom from limitation. 
But why should we do that? I mean, why is that obligatory? Where does that obligation come from? He says that if you don't uh, do this, you're living inauthentically. You should live authentically because that's, uh, uh, you're, you're living from what you really are. You're, you're expressing your freedom. Uh, but uh, why should I do that, you know, if there's no God? So uh, I think Sartre's ethics is uh, irrationalistic in the final analysis. But uh, surprisingly, he has a number of positive things to say about uh, obligations and uh, freedom and that kind of thing. The preceding program has been brought to you by RTS on iTunes U and may not be reproduced or disseminated in part or in whole for sale or for profit without express written consent. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920.